Hi, I'm Keith. And I'm Michael. And we're Atlas Genius, and you're watching Mosh Cam. For me, because I play guitar, um, I feel like the songs where I can kind of um, go off and have a bit of a um, psychedelic moment are good for me. Like, I enjoy playing um, backseat uh, because we've kind of, there's a section that is just kind of, it's there to be messed with. So uh, I enjoy that. That's probably my favourite song to play live. I mean, Trojans is like, is, I mean, in America, that's the, that's the that was the first single. So, I mean, um, it's one of those ones that we can almost stop singing and the crowd sings along. So um, that's always going to be, I think, a bit of a winner live. But uh, if so, it's getting there as well. That's getting a lot of radio play over there. So uh, generally, like, songs people know, uh, it always helps those, uh, those songs, you know, react live. Backseat also gets a, a little, uh, you know, that gets the crowd going. Cause it, it, he sort of takes a walk through the crowd and gets those guys done. Yeah, if the, if the venue, like if there's this, you know, if you can actually get down, there's like a, a barrier. It's good just to kind of get down and get up, and, up close and personal with the with the crowd. You do get a bit of a grope from time to time, but um, you know, it's all part of. It's, it's one of those risks that I'm willing to take in the in the, in the performance. You know, I can't do that as a drummer. I can't really just get up and just no. walk out. It's true. You're grope free. Yeah. I think that during the, the, the probably the experiences when you're writing the album and during the process is probably the, the most enjoyable. Like right at the end, that there's so much pressure that you put on yourself when you're recording an album, and and, when, and and signing off on an album is such a big thing because while you're writing and recording an album, there's n there's not as much pressure that you can take risks and if you don't get it right, you can just go back and do it again. But that moment where you kind of sign off on an album is, is a lot of pressure. So I, I, for me, the most enjoyable parts were hearing back. Some of the songs where you get them to where they're pretty much done, you know, and you're listening back and going, okay, I think this song is is feeling good, you know. Um, like I remember with If So was like that. Um, actually, Backseat, I think for me, it was probably the most exciting because it that, that whole song, the from the first time, the first part of it we started to write to when it was finished was 24 hours. Like the whole thing was recorded and written in 24 hours, which doesn't happen normally. So that was kind of just pain free it's like you just after a day's work we're like wow that, that song's finished so that was cool yeah my favourite moment was actually the day it came out and that that, that week it came out it was a big relief that the, the album was finally out and to see it sort of climb the iTunes charts in the, in the USA like to watch it go up and you think oh shit that's yeah. our band is you know in the iTunes charts in the USA you know that's a pretty pretty surreal yeah. moment taking screenshots of it <laughs> my favourite thing about playing with Michael in a band is that uh, I don't have to spend time and kind of go, hey, I want you to play it this way or whatever, because there's that strong bond musically that you have, um, because we're so close and we've had similar musical uh, influences over the years. You can sort of um, cut out a lot of the BS and you, know, you, don't, you don't have to sugarcoat everything and you know you can bypass and save a lot of time you know yeah, not in the way about offending, offending someone we often offend each other and just yeah. get over it the next that, day that's also the thing that I hate the most about yeah. being in a band with your brother is that there is there is no sugar coating sometimes it would be nice if you know you were to deliver something in a in a more uh, diplomatic way but hey I can't be. that's I never going to happen that's just that's the way we are the f our first headline show of our last two hours which was our first ever US headline show in Austin, Texas at a place called Emo's was pretty amazing. It was 1,800 people sold out on our first headline show in Austin, Texas. And who, you know, two years ago I never thought I'd be in the USA at, in Austin, Texas playing a sold out, sold out, you know, massive club. And that was I mean, an amazing moment. Yeah, uh, that's same for me. Like that show and a few other shows that on that headline tour where um, you play, you know, pretty big rooms, and they were sold out. And, and, and because it's our crowd, the reaction is just um, so much stronger than when you if you're just supporting a, a band as an unknown band or whatever. And they were great moments. I was for me, my goal in life in music was always if we could get at music to the point where you could play to 200 people or something in some random part of the world, and to play to like those kinds of crowds was um, was great. Playing uh, late night TV shows, those American uh, talk shows, is they're pretty surreal. I mean, Letterman was the one that we grew up watching because 
you know, Fallon is probably the one of the biggest ones over there now as well. But Letterman's the one that quite. But Letterman's the one that we always grew up uh, watching. So I mean, to actually be standing on that set that you've seen like a thousand times, um, and David Letterman's just there, introduces the band and you start playing. Um, that's that's pretty amazing, especially and also because that set is the Ed Sullivan Theatre where the Beatles played and you know countless others. So that was pretty amazing. All those all those late night shows have been great. It's so much smaller than you think. That set is t- is tiny, you know. But um, I mean, you're literally the stage is literally probably ten meters from from Letterman's desk, you know. So it's uh, it's pretty cosy. And it's actually and you've got Letterman here. You're playing here. There's a crowd there. Paul Shaver. Paul Shaver and his band, like literally, you can touch them. It's yeah, it's a small thing. We were w- pretty warned about Letterman. That um, he's been doing it for a long time, and if he doesn't like a band, he, he won't say anything. And so if, if he comes over and shakes your hand and, and talks about you, it's a good sign. So we finished, and he came over and, and come back as well, and, and invited us back, and, and, we, and we spoke for a bit. So that was a good sign. The fact that we didn't get snubbed by uh, by David Letterman was good. For me, it's um, a good scotch. Just getting a good. Uh, it's a problem. It's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a problem yet, and um, and so like you know, a good scotch like a a Lafroy or some kind of scotch like that. Yeah, that's kind of it's my thing. We are gonna add um, Labrador puppies to our rider, but this hasn't happened yet. Okay. Mike wants dogs. Dogs. Um, to eat, of course. Whoa! I, I thought you were vegetarian. Uh, I'm a vegetarian. I try and steer away from personally from uh, from cliched rock poses as good as they are. Um, like we use in-ear monitors, so we don't have uh, wedges. I mean, I guess you know that's the thing that we can't do is the, the foot up on the wedge, the whole emo. that whole kind of thing. Um, it's kind of it's, fa- it's sort of being phased out through in-ear monitors. Uh, otherwise, I guess that would be my thing. <laughs> um, I just really can't do anything. I just get sweaty. Uh, that's all I do. Uh, that's my. Fr- I just like to get sweaty. And just That's your move. have a really bad hair, hairdo by the end of the set. I was actually talking about it today. Um, for me, the one is when we did Leno. Um, the tonight is it the Tonight Show? What's it? Tonight Show. The yeah. Tonight Show with Leno, and um, you, you sound check about four hours before you actually play. Um, so we we did the sound check, and then we had hours to kill. And I was we had really nice dressing rooms, like ridiculously comfortable. So I kind of fell asleep on one of the couches, and. Uh, and someone knocked on the door, and I thought it was one of the techs coming in to ask a question. So I was like, I'm just going to ignore this and make out I'm still asleep. And uh, so they went away. And then we did the later on. We played the, the the song at the end of the show, and and Leno comes over and shakes my hand, and he's like, Oh, I came into the dressing room to say hello, but you were asleep on air. And uh, so I missed my opportunity to to, to have a little uh, yarn with uh, with Leno. So I mean, that was kind of you know disappointing, but yeah, that's my story. Um. Mine was actually the thing you might have forgotten about it as well. Was um, in Portland, Oregon. Then look up, and then this beaten up combi van, Volkswagen van, and it's a bass player of Nirvana, Chris Novoselic, stepping out of the, the combi van, checking into our hotel. And um, and then I went back and saw these guys and said, "Have a guess what I saw?" And they, you know, I don't think they really believed me. But then, as you're walking back to the hotel, everyone came back with me. He was walking out of the hotel as we were walking in, and we, we started talking to him for a bit. And you know, he then he asked if we were in a band or whatever, and and he knew he'd heard our single on the radio and and knew of our band and knew knew the song yeah. and liked it. And you know, just uh, someone like that had actually heard of us it was a pretty surreal. I mean, growing up with Nirvana as as one of your favourite bands yeah. to meet Chris Neversilic, I mean, that's just. We even got the uh, Instagram photo to prove it. Instagram, to prove yeah, it. it's slightly it's blurry, like, but. Yeah. <laughs>